We are live here at the Farmer's Market in Revelstoke. I'm here today with uh, Mr. Raymond Cooper, our local butcher. Uh, my name is Glenn Charlotte. I'm the private chef and health coach here at Big Mountain Kitchen and Lynn. We are out here every Saturday morning doing our live videos, trying to take away some of the stigma about cooking is hard. <laughs> I don't think it's very hard. We've been doing it for millennia, and uh, you know we do it every day. It's one of those like life skills that you actually freaking need. So easy a caveman could do it. Don't you think, right? Don't you think? Uh, today we're doing a Father's Day special. We're doing pan-fried steaks and grilled steaks, uh, just to take away some of the weirdness, I guess, around and the stigma that people think meat cooking meat is hard. It's not at all. It's one of the best things you can do. Uh, Ray, you've been a butcher now for how long? Uh, well, I've been in business. I'm working on my eighth full year now. Wow, uh, so I've been a butcher for about 11 years now. 11 years? Yeah. Awesome. And I hear it runs in your family? Uh, sort of. My grandfather on my mother's side was a butcher, trained nice. the traditional way in Germany. I believe the, his picture's on the wall in your shop. It is. That's right. With the big sausage press. That's right. <laughs> sausage. We should do sausage in the fall, I think, perhaps. Let's Definitely. get together and do a sausage demo. Because sausage is one of those things that not many people really understand, I think. Like, and it's quite easy to make. With uh, some relatively inexpensive equipment, you can make it in your kitchen. It's, Absolutely. it's pretty easy. Yeah, it's, it's all about what? Grinding, picking some good meat, adding some seasoning, and then figuring out how to put that stuff inside that sausage case. Exactly. Right? It's not a necessary thing either. The casing is just a, a way of delivering the meat, really. The, 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 the sausage itself is the inside. It's a payload delivery system for Tasty. There you go. I love that. Payload delivery system. So today, you want to describe the steaks we've got here for us today? All right, so today I've brought a ribeye steak because that is the classic and it's a great idea for a Father's Day gift if you're a little bit behind the curve. Uh, and then it is a grilling steak. Now, the ribeye is basically the prime rib prepared as a steak with no bone. And uh, it is exquisitely tender on the ribeye muscle and then the cap muscle has quite a bit of uh, marbling in it which gives it just its own wonderful flavor. Uh, of course, you have to get, put some good grill marks on it in order to uh, put up the presentation. And of course, we have Glenn, who's perfectly qualified to be able to do this uh, I've cooked, service I've for us. I've cooked a few steaks in my <laughs> time, let me tell you. Of course. Uh, so, uh, what do you like on your steak? Um, I like my steaks au naturel. Yeah, I'm, see, I'm a little bit of a purist. I may throw a little salt and pepper on there just to pull a little bit more of the flavor out. It gives a nice little flavor look on there, too. Oh, and that reminds me, a good thing to know about your steaks is that you don't really want to cook them from refrigerated. You always want to put them out from the fridge, let them sit on your counter. Don't be afraid, you're not going to poison the family. Just let them sit out for 45 minutes to an hour and get to room temperature. Because if you take a really cold steak and you throw it on a really hot grill, all the muscle fibers are going to contract and your steak is going to get tougher. So. For best results, let it reach room temperature first. I agree with you 100%. Um, another thing for me, if there is a little bit of moisture on this, on th I like to pat it off as well because the moisture is what really will help, well, what causes a lot of the sticking action. That's right. Right? So we've got a little griddle here that we're getting nice and warmed up here. I'm gonna throw this guy onto him. So we're gonna show you guys a little trick about grill marks. That's why you get that professional looking steak that's got the cross hatches on it. So, well, well I'll, this has been out here for a couple minutes now. Yep. So, put this guy on right here, and it's going to go in right and listen to it sizzle. Nice. Notice how I've got this on a little bit of an angle. So, there's the, the bar lines like this, which would also be your barbecue line. Yep. If you were working on a barbecue, it would be the same, same kind of concept. So, this, one of the things I always tell people, don't play with it. If you put it on the, on the grill, just let it, let it go. It'll touch, it'll be there, it will release itself when it's ready to go. That's why if you try and pull that steak up right away, you'll get all that fibers will be stuck to those, those grills. That's right, and another thing I see a lot of people doing is they take their spatula and they start pressing down oh, on God. it. And yep. all you're doing there is you're squeezing all of the juice out and you're giving yourself a dry flavorless steak. That's it, yeah. Just the touche pas. It's one of those things. It's, cooking is, is not really hard. It's more patience than I think anything else. And a lot of people are like, oh, gotta turn it right away. No, just let it go. If you really need to, look on the side. Yep. You'll see the side will start turning a little bit on the gray side. That's just it cooking right now. Right. One thing that I forgot to do. Oh, we'll just put that one in there. Yeah, put that one in there. So right now I'm cooking on a cast iron griddle that's got a little bit of air gap between the actual bottom of the pan and the top. So we're only getting the top ridge lines, which is gonna create these marks on the outside of the steak which are called the grill marks. 
go figure. Grill, <laughs> Marks, awesome. Uh, again, different types of uh, flavors, uh, temperatures of steak. Yep. So most people know that we can go from blue rare, rare, medium rare, medium, medium well, well done. I believe that if you go any further than medium, you, you might as well eat ground beef. That's right. Right? Like you've just taken a nice piece of meat and basically just you've cooked it to the point where you have all the juices have now been pulled right that right out of it. And a lot of people are concerned that if you cook a steak rare that it's raw. Well, it's definitely not raw. Or bloody. Or, or bloody. And it's not bloody. There's no blood in any commercial meat. It's all been uh -huh. removed. So, the main thing to remember is that the only place any bacteria can grow is on the outside surface of the steak. So, so long as you're not doing something like taking a fork and stabbing it a bunch of times, all the bacteria is on the outside. It's dead as soon as it touches a hot grill. There you go. Um, and then the inside is... Uh, completely bacteria free it will never harm you and that's why we can eat steaks like blue rare and people don't get sick from that's it, it. that's I, I personally I, I slowly lowered my my cut because I just I, I kept asking for medium rare and I kept going into medium wealth and I kept going less and less and people tend to overcook their meat I find like it's you gotta the thing about meat for sure That's it right. will literally cook for up to 10 to 15 minutes. That's where we have what we call a rest period. Yep. So that will be, pull it off, let it sit on the counter. I like to put it like on a plate with a cover on top, a piece of tin foil, a little a bowl flipped upside down on top. That's going to allow that meat to rest. It's going to take the moisture and suck back into the meat. That's right. And that way when you cut your steak, you don't end up with all of that sort of watery juice just sort of floating around on your plate. But most Not people doing call anybody blood. any good. <laughs> oh, definitely not blood. No. All I, won't, right. I won't go into the gory details, but there is no blood in your meat. Nope. It's all out. It's all been done. All right, so I just gave it a little turn there, I, a quarter turn. Uh, that'll create another set of lines going the opposite direction, which will create that little diamond pattern. Yep. So if you look here, oh, I bet you we can't show that. Maybe you can see it from the top, maybe. We're getting to the point where we're about halfway or a quarter of the way up that steak. So in my world, that's the time where I gotta start flipping that sucker over to be a nice medium rare. Let's go do this guy, boom. And All look right. at how good that looks. There you go, my friends. That is what you're looking for. Those are called grill marks. Yeah. So, you wanna learn, that's, the, you, I just showed you how to do that quarter turn. That's all it takes just to make those nice lines. Mine's a, maybe a little bit off, they're not a hundred percent, but still. My, mine look things. a lot clumsier than that and they're usually vertical. So, it, it, that's it, right? <laughs> Uh, so at this point, for me, I would start throwing pan veg in here, like a little bit of onions, a little bit of, uh, if I'm going to do asparagus or mushrooms and onions, I start throwing that stuff into there at that point, this point right now. That way it cooks at the same time. But we're going to get this guy off the edge of the leveler. We're going to give it another quarter turn there. And that's a great tip for the bachelors watching at home, that you can just throw your stir fry in there with right it in and there. save a dish. Yep. So a couple of other things. So if you guys tuned in last week when we did our bone broth, I had her boiling up here. Uh, so I took that whole pot that I had on here and I reduced it down for like three more days. And I got this. So this here is what you'd like to call a demi. So I reduced all that, I think it was what, five, well, five gallons of, of liquid down to about a liter. And it got nice and thick. So you go inside here mm -hmm. and it's like, I call this meat soup. So. That is what I like to do for a pan sauce. So what after, after cooking the steak and I put it on the, the rest, I'll take some butter and some, some of this. Maybe I'll deglaze the pan with some white wine or red wine, or depending on what kind of flavor, add all that stuff in there and then make a sauce directly in the pan. So that's using up all that caramelized meat that was in the bottom. Yep. Thanks. So we are getting to the point. Oh yeah, there we go. And there you can see the fat is starting to render. That's it. Render, what is that word? Uh, well, rendering is basically just reducing it from a solid state to more of a gelatinous state. Um, you, usually when you buy a ribeye, there'll be like a big chunk of fat in it, or uh, at some point there'll be a band of fat that actually looks quite thick. Mm. And a lot of people actually get concerned about that because they don't want to be eating all of that or chewing on all of it while they're cutting up their steak. And the truth is, is that when you cook it, if you can see it here, that band basically begins to melt away and that's yeah. going to flavor all of the meat around that's it. That's it. That's where it's developing that flavor inside that pan. That's right. So it's the same, same concept as bacon. When you're rendering, when you're cooking bacon in a thing, all that fat, that's rendering out of the bacon. That's right. So, 
Right on. We've got a little bit of dog fight over here today. We're in the market here in Revelstoke. It is a glorious day. Look at all the people out here. This is going to be a sweltering day, I think. So, right it's a now, great day to barbecue. I've got, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to be doing later on today. So, we've got, a, we've got high temperature here. We're doing like 380, 390 on this thing. These meats can handle that. They right? can definitely they handle that. They can definitely that. handle that high heat. Barbecue, you can even go higher, like three, 400, 500 degrees. It's not going to burn unless you leave it on there too long. That's right. The best tip anybody can give you for when you're barbecuing as well, and a lot of people don't know this, never close your lid. No. If you close the lid, you're not grilling. Grilling is heat from one direction. Yeah. Close the lid, it is now an oven. oven. You're baking. That's exactly it. So we're going to do a little testy here. Don't touch that. We're sitting at 124.9, 127, 128. So we're getting into that rare state right now. If we look on here, our beef medium rare is 40, 145 Fahrenheit or 63. We don't want to go, no, see right here, we're going to, well done, uh, 170. Ruined. Ruined. <laughs> we're already, we're almost past where I like it right now on the, on the old grilled steak here. We're and another good side. tip about oh. that is, as Glenn mentioned, the steak continues to cook itself after you remove it That's from the it. heat. So you want to take it away three to five degrees before your target zone and then let it sit. But we're and getting there pretty close, right? It will get to where you want it to be on its own. It is at, it's self-cooking at that point. So you check another side of it too. There should be thinner, fatter sections too. Could be different. That's a really important when you're cooking chicken. Yeah. Uh, if, we're, if you're going after a chicken breast, you'll notice that usually always, always test your temperature at the thickest, thickest point of part. the chicken. That's it. Yeah. That way you know you're going to get the right temperature. Don't mess around with salmonella. It's serious. <laughs> it is. All right. So. Another thing you learn when you cook a few steaks, a couple tenderness tricks. You ever do this one? I am terrible at that one. So I have never done Here's it. a little trick. If you want to slip it to the top of you there, Jeff. So if you pinch your finger here, that's going to be a rare. That's going to be a mid-rare. Medium. Medium well. And then you don't want to do that one. If you're, that's how hard. Yeah. That's too hard. No one likes that. So if you're going for that softness. So if you feel that, right now I'm at like a medium, medium rare. So I'm going to pull that guy off right now. Now, we were talking earlier about the resting. So, this is what I do for a rest. Yep. That's it. A little tent, a piece of tinfoil, another plate over top. That works. A bowl. That's one of those things. And the rule of thumb for resting time is, is that you want to let it sit for about half the time it took you to cook it. Right. Or 15 minutes. Whichever, whichever comes first. So, if you're cooking a really big roast and you cooked it for like two hours, obviously you're not going to let it sit for an entire hour. Let it sit for 15 minutes. Let it get some of those juices back in it and then carve it up. And then you're not going to end up with that watery, watery juice on your plate. It'll stay in the meat and it'll keep everything tasty and tender. All right, so I'm just going to do a little bit of this here. This is what I was talking about earlier about pan sauce. So I just take a little bit of butter, throw it in that pan to kind of get rid of that. I don't have any red wine, but if I had red wine, I've been putting some red wine in there. That would help the glaze. Not really so much for the alcohol, because the second you put the, uh, that in there, all that alcohol burns off. That's right. But it does have a nice flavor. Mm -hmm. And then I'll take a little bit of demi. I'm going to make this little sauce here. And that's pretty much it, ladies and gentlemen, right there. I'll make that's, this into And that's going to put a lot of flavor onto the next steak. That's exactly that. That smells wonderful. Yeah. I haven't had breakfast yet, and this is making my mouth water. So there we go. We got a nice little thick sauce there. Well, let's maybe pull out one of the little couteaus here. Oh, not that guy. So we're, we're going to let him rest for a couple more minutes. There's a nice slicer. We'll give that guy a little whirl in a minute. So the next one we're going to do is the strip loin steak. A lot of people still know that as the, uh, as the New York strip. Um, yeah. It is basically the large half of a T-bone steak, mm -hmm. uh, cut as a boneless steak. Now it's made characteristic is that it's a very consistent muscle the whole way through. So every time you buy a strip loin, you know what you're going to get each and every single time. You don't need an educated eye to pick a good strip loin going to have one band of fat along the side and it's going to be lean along the other yep. and it may have this larger muscle here called the gluteus medius which would be basically mean if it was a t-bone it would be a porterhouse there we go. Uh, so this is the, one of the bigger strip loins you can possibly get we're going to we're going to switch out pans here too we're going to go to the old stainless steel because this one here we're going to leave that so that's our little pan sauce there we'll have that with the, the other steak this one here we're going to get it a little bit warm i'm going to put a little bit of butter in there 
Sounds good. Just because I think a little, that is flavor for me. Yep. Uh, this is a new product I just found recently. It's uh, ghee. So this is grass-fed butter that has been um, reduced down and all the, all the, the, the uh, lactic, not the lactic, pardon me, the, the milk fats have been removed. So this is like shelf stable. It'll, it'll stay on the shelf like in this kind of semi-solid form. But it's got like what I like to call like a, a nutty flavor to it. Because you've cooked out all this stuff and it's been cooked for a little bit, it's got this really cool flavor. Let's turn that back on now. There we go. So, just so you know, we have the frame for the head stuff to the shot and here. So if you're this showing top off top? here, if you're showing off here, yep. that'll see it. Over, over here, here. no? Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, thanks. So let's do a little bit of salt and pepper on this guy too. Yep. Salt is a chemical tenderizer for meat. That's a good thing that to know too. That is really, yeah. That, and we're, we've kind of gone away from iodized salt, uh, all that stuff. I'm really promoting the uh, pink Himalayan salt right now. Pink Himalayan salt, coarse salt, kosher yeah. salt. Those are all good choices. Yeah. Just don't use your table salt. No, table salt is, is made for the table. That's like a little squirt in your soup or something like that. Yeah. But uh, most cooking, I like using kosher salt because it's, it's a flat salt. Yep. So when you grab the salt and you kind of shift it a little, it'll actually grind itself down in a nice flakiness and it works really well. Other than that, we go, like I said, a grinder, pepper mill, fresh is better. Oh, I don't know if you can smell that, that right now. That smells great. Right? You can smell that. It's like a little bit of a nutty flavor. Again, we're trying to get this pan up to a nice scalding temperature. We're only at 260 right now. Uh, the ghee does have a higher smoking point than regular butter. There's nothing, none of the impurities are in there like this butter here. This Which is good still for cooking meat because you're not going to burn it. Yeah, that's the thing. So, and it, it, this is the same product pretty much, except this still has the milk fat in it. This does not. Again, this I found at the at Savon. It is uh, really, really. Uh, does that make it hypoallergenic for dairy? Uh, there is no dairy in that. Actually. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that. So, oh, there we go. Now we're getting a little bit warm. You can feel it. We're in a 310, 312 degree range here. Again, you want to when you're putting your make sure your pan and your oil are hot. And when you put this in, it should make that sizzling sound because you want it to grab a little bit. That's, That's right. That's what creates that, that caramelization on there. Boom, yada. You hear that there? Yep. There we go. And you can also spice your butter on this as well. Like oh. you can put some put some garlic in it. Absolutely, garlic, shallots, onions. All that, that's building all the flavors. Again, whatever you cook in the bottom of that pan, again, you can turn it into a nice pan sauce after that. Yeah. Let's take a look at this guy here. Let's see what happened in this guy. So, I'm gonna give you a little spot. Here. I'm gonna put this here. So, as we were talking earlier, this, what do we got here, Ray? That is the uh, the juice that's come out of the out of the meat. It's not blood. Nope. And it is 100% tasty. Oh, it's, yeah. You can literally throw that back into that, put it into that. But well, we're going to leave it over there so that when we put this back out here, we're going to cut a little bit up. I can't wait. So. That is like perfectly medium. That's a medium right there. A little yeah. bit rare. As we get into the middle too, it should change. Look at that. There we go. That's boom. That is just great. Oh, there we go. You. So that's about as much as you'd want to cook that. Mm -hmm. You can see that from the top there. That's a medium, medium rare, medium rare, medium mm -hmm. steak. Oh, and that's melty. Very tender, very oh, tasty. Got extra flavor. We got some people watching. Maybe they want to try some. Hold on. Hold on. We're gonna do this here. Chew it. For the buggies. Have a, have a piece of steak. Here, we'll put a little bit of this guy on here too. How's that? Excellent. Oh, let's put all that on top of that guy. There we go. Boom. All right, so we're back over here to this guy. Uh, one thing you would do notice too, when you do put meat onto the, into the heat, it will start shrinking up. It will. Right? It's part of the water coming out of there. But it, like right now, I like to keep a little base on this guy. This is going to let go. Oh, look at it. already dead. Look at that. So let's take a look at it. Oh, I think I ruined it. Oh, really? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we're going to flip this guy over. And look at Boom. that. See this? Little karst on the outside here. That's what you're looking for. 
If you can get that whole steak looking like that, that's a good crop. Yeah. So, one other thing we can do with this guy, let's get rid of this here for a minute for me there, Ray. I need to get a little cleaning action here. Is I'll baste this sucker with butter too. So you just take a little corner of the pan here. Yep. And just keep doing this. This is a butter basted steak. This is one of those things that a couple of herbs, a couple of pieces of garlic inside here, the flavor of that oil. It'll all just seep in. You'll be yep. surprised how deep it can get. Oh yeah. And you can just sit here with this for until you're done, really. But we got a little bit of redness on the side. We're gonna keep that one going. Yep. I'm going to pull this guy away here, and we're going to carve him up a little bit more. So, another thing, that, a misconception I also have been told, is fat will make you fat. Eating the fat is going to make you fat. I'm like, actually... It, I, have a, I have an anecdote to share. Oh. Um, a customer of mine, who happens to be a local physician, was one time buying a ribeye steak, and he wanted specifically the fattest one that I, I had available. And I said it was kind of surprising to me that somebody who's a doctor would be looking to buy something with so much fat. And he told me the worst thing that the medical society had done in the last 10 years was convince everyone to stop eating fat. Because they replaced it with carbs and the results Sugar. have just been terrible. Yeah. Um, he says they spent 10 years convincing everyone to stop eating fats and they're going to spend 20 years convincing everybody to eat them again. Yeah. A totally. little bit of fat is perfect for your health. Oh, yeah, definitely. All right. Anybody else want to have a try a piece? Don't be shy, it's delicious. Come, Come on, on, Peter. I know you want to, you've been eyeballing it. <laughs> Here we go. Here, have a little have a chunk of chunky. Wow, thank you. Little peas. We don't we don't judge, just put your oh. fingers in there. Mm. Jeffrey? Mm. Oh yeah. Get that guy right there. That's another. Really... This is one of my favorite chunks right here. Mm -hmm. This is like I would like I call that the nose. Mm -hmm. It's like it's, it's like a piece of chain. So there's a like this is like so tender. It's got a nice little chunk of fat cap on here. It's got a ton of flavor. Try a piece. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a ribeye steak. I'm getting butter splashed on my arm. Oh, there we that go. That burns. <laughs> it's burning. I'll go the other way. So. Again, we've gone through this one here. He's been on there for about five minutes. He's probably a good medium rare right now. Again, yep. feeling that temp, that... <laughs> Let's look. Oh. So there we go, oh, my Hold friend. on. You may oh. want to stand that up on the fat band there. Oh. Stand it up on the fat band. Yeah. Just to finish off a, a pan-fried uh, strip loin steak, stand it up on that fat band that's on the one side, render it down a little bit, make it all nice and tasty and chewy, give it that nice texture. Mm, I like that idea. Gordon Ramsay approves. Oh yeah. So again, if you look inside this pan here, we've got a whole bunch of like leftover meat that's in there. Yep. So that is that's what we were looking at in that same pan there last time, was to make that sort of pan sauce. Let's put this guy. Ooh, let's put this guy here, and we'll cover him up again too with this. And guy. I can see, as compared to the grill, this one's got a different finish on it. Totally. It's actually kind of crispy on the top. It's going to have a nice little crunch on it. It will. Uh, if you put certain sauces on it, it'll actually caramelize and become a little crispy. There we go. That's our butter sauce again. Let's pour a little bit of this in here and make some of that again. I love the smell of that. And that is like, that is concentrated beef broth. That is, yeah, that is like marrow. That is like, it's been, what did I, how long did I boil that? Almost, almost 72 hours, I think, by the time I was done. But that's, that's just a little topper sauce right here. This goes like this on here. Ooh. Oh, look at that yummy little dark morsel. <laughs> All right, so let's put this guy over here. And we're gonna do one more. Now the last steak that I brought with me today uh, is a bit of a cooking oddity because a lot of people just don't know what to do with it. Um, so this here is a bottom blade simmering steak. Now you don't normally see simmering steaks, but no. they're always available if your butcher knows where to cut them. Um, so this is from a cut, it's from the shoulder of the animal. It's got lots and lots of interstitial fat, lots and lots of marbling. And this is typically what I would be cutting like stew beef from, like we would cube this, and then you would throw that into your crock pot or your, uh, or your stove pot, and then uh, make that into a really tasty tender stew. But you can do it as a steak, and the process is pretty similar. So 
what we're going to do is this is going to go into the pan. I think Glenn's going to brown it. Brown it. And then we're going to add a bunch of sauce to it, and we're essentially going to make a stew steak. Yeah. And it is just so tasty when it's done right. It's like a breeze almost. Yeah. All right, so we're going to do again with a little bit of the ghee in here, because I really like the smell of that one. That was really nice. Mm -hmm. Again, cast iron takes the beating, keeps on ticking. So we're going to melt this down again. We're going for that high heat again. Yep. And so basically when you're doing the high heat sear on the top of a steak, you're, you're sealing those juices in. That's right. The, the, the meat, right? So that's where you're trying to get is that really quick, really fast, because if we saw that other steak that we just put down there, that crispiness, that's what's going to be the one that's blocking all those tish, that tissue and keeping all that uh, moisture inside there. Keeps all your flavor inside. That's it. I can't look at this stuff and not try and eat some I more know, of it. Right? I, I can't believe I'm having a hard time giving away prime rib. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna get there, up here a little bit. The old, oh, we're not there right close yet. Again, Mr. Pepper and Mr. Salt. There we go. There. So again, not too much again. Uh, oh, don't overdo it. Uh, you, you can you can always add, you can never take away. That's it's right. One of those things that I always worry about people with their salt and stuff like that. I'm like, don't put handfuls of salt in any of your cooking. That's why there's salt in the table. Right? That's right. You do need you do need to pull a little bit in to like get the moistures out, pull out flavors and whatnot, but do not oversalt stuff. It, it, it's it's a travesty when you did when you're like ah, especially fish. All right, so we're getting to that point where yep, 340. It's gonna make that sound again. Yep. Boom. Art. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm gonna get attacked by the the. The shoe fly. Well, you got no flies coming, I bet. No, no. Not right now. All right. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Now, this steak I also selected out of the counter because it is starting to turn a little bit brown. Oh, yeah. Some people get a little bit squeamish about it. Try some of the try some of this stuff yeah, right here. This is this is a thermo thermometer. Oh, you did the pan. Yeah. It, it doesn't work for the gentleman done this on the steak. That's this guy right here. Yeah. 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 I saw you use that. Yeah. The pan you were doing. That's it, checking the pan heat. Yeah. So the steak I selected here is starting to get a little bit brown. Uh, a lot of people get kind of squeamish when they see meat starting to turn brown. They think it's gone bad. Nothing could be further from the truth. What's happened is there's been a chemical reaction inside of it from the contact with the oxygen, uh, and a, a compound inside the meat called myoglobin has turned into metmyoglobin. And that's a sciencey way of saying that it is going to taste stronger and it's going to be more tender. Yeah. All right, let's take this guy apart here. Let's take a look at the old, this guy. So back, we came back to the New York strip here. Butter juices. I'm gonna, yep, this was cooked on a stainless steel. So as you can tell, we've got a little bit more of that crusty caramelization on the other, on this side here. Yep. Let's go through here. Oh, look at that. Another perfectly cooked steak, right. two in a row. Two in a row. Yeah, I used to, I've been cooking now for pretty close to four decades, and it wasn't until I moved to Revelstoke I started actually doing barbecue catering that I started doing like a lot of steak. Yeah. So a couple of golf tournaments in, you know, the Trues for Toss with the RCMP, and a couple of those, you know, you start cooking 140, 150 steaks at a time. You get good fast. You get pretty good, fatty fast. So see, there's there's one of my spots right there. That's where, that's as about as much as I'd like to cook. Let's have a little cheers to this guy here, the New York Strip. Cheers. Boom. Yeah. Mm. And you can taste that ghee. Mm. The taste is all the way through it. Mm -hmm. It's so wonderful. Nice and tender. Oh, that is nice. That's a great steak, right? Mm -hmm. That is really nice. It definitely tastes, there's a different flavor from this steak to this steak. Mm -hmm. Absolutely sure. Even though they're not that far away from each other on the animals, is that correct? Um, these two actually, I'm sorry, they are they a are little bit. Close. Uh, they are a little bit uh, distant. Mm -hmm. There's there's at least a couple cuts in between them. Right. But the, it does. There is a difference between different parts of the animal. Oh yeah. So this is my ketchup. <laughs> If someone ever decided to put ketchup on a steak, I would probably lose my nuts. Uh, even steak sauce, it's just you're just adding sugar. Barbecue sauce, sugar. You gotta remember, 
And I'll t another thing about barbecue sauce and the barbecue is do not put it on before. That's right. The final thing you do before you take anything off the barbecue is, is that sauce part. It doesn't take much. A little spice there, bud? You want to try that one there, Jeff? I got oh. I got to try this with some of the yep, demi glaze. Try the demi. Mm. How do we do on that demi? Literally finger looking good. Oh yeah. All right. Oh, I am advertising. I'm a showman. Yeah, we're on live on Facebook right now. These guys, ah. these guys have taken the considerable risk of providing me with an audience. That's it. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think you're also involved in the theater company here in town as well, are you not? I am something of an actor. Yeah. I think that's a really fun thing. I, yeah. wanna, I think I might be uh, tempted to try that in the fall. We'll see how that goes. Uh, well, there are auditions coming up later this week. I'm going to might as well plug this in there. Here we Flying go. Arrow Productions is mounting uh, Shrek the Musical, and they are going to need a whole bunch of talented people to participate in that. It's going to be the first attempt at a local musical in quite a long time. It's wow. going to be a big undertaking. That sounds amazing. Is it going to be at the Performing Arts Center? Um, it's too early to say. I'm, oh, not, I'm not actually involved. I'm going to be auditioning just like everybody else. Oh, that's pretty fun. I just know about it. Now you know about it. That's it's your it. opportunity to possibly get discovered. So now we've got a nice little crust on this guy here. I'm going to throw him in there and, and base her up a bit. Okay. Okay. So this is what we're going to do here. We're going to add a little bit more of our nice demi sauce. This is what you'd call a simmering steak. It right? is a simmering steak. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Got a little away from me. So, don't take the heat down. Leave that heat in there again. And you're just gonna have. Do you want to lid this guy? Um, you could. Would you? Like, because um, if you if you lid it, it's gonna trap in all this vapor that's escaping, right. and that's gonna apply moisture to the top there. The drip, drip. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I don't have a lid with me right now, but guess what? Is that gonna work? Nope. Maybe this one. Oh, necessity is the mother of invention. That's it, right? It's probably a little dirty. I'm going to take this and do that. No biggie. So, yeah, this one here, we're, we're going to try and almost steam it. That's right. Right? It's going to take all that moisture. It's going to pull it at, pull it in there. Now, uh, because it's a simmering steak, that means it likes wet, wet heat, uh, wet cooking methods. So you want to be able to, like, steam it. You want to be able to simmer it. You want it to sit in those juices and let that moisture break down the fat, That's which it. is going to make it tender. That's it. Yeah. And then, uh, like I said, cook it low or longer. Yep. Because it's going to take a little bit longer to get that steam and all that stuff in there. The juice in there's going to come in there. Again, you're going to have that sauce all That's ready right. to go in there. It's it's one of those things that I just the the demi glass one. The stock part, let's, that's how you build flavor, right? You're taking the whole animal, using all the bones, roasting, boiling it down. Like I had to get rid of my bones, they end up going away. And I was hoping to like run it for a week. Yep. Uh, so we're gonna do, we're gonna do a lot more demi this year. Uh, maybe show a whole section on how to do it this fall. Uh, pan sauces, butter compost. There's another thing we have not talked about yet either. This is where you take herbs and spices and you make mix it in with butter, and then you try. You're, I like to roll it out, make a little log out of it, mm -hmm. freeze it up just a touch so that it gets a little harder, and then you could cut it into like one ounce chunks. That is one of those toppers, just like a perfect little little ball of, of, of stuff on top, because that's again the butter is going to melt in with that with the with the fats that are naturally in the meat, mm -hmm. and it's going to just be magnifica. And this is also a really good steak that because you have all this sauce, you can throw all of like your your onions, your potatoes, mushrooms, yeah. uh, carrots, veg, everything can go into the pan that's with it. it. You're basically making yourself a mini a mini stew. stew. That's it. Hey guys, how are you? All right. Well, this one's gonna be a little bit, so we're gonna have a little, a little, a little taste of this guy. We'll put some in the meat soup here. No one else wants to eat it, we'll eat it. That's right. More for us. So, um, Typically, we, we, we chose to do steak today, but other pan-fried meats, sausages, for instance, would be mm -hmm. another one. Sausages are really agreeable. Right. You cook them any way you want. Yep, grill pan, fat pan, stainless steel pan. Really, it comes down to your preference, and really. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I like to like bake some of my sausages prior to, to doing, especially for like pasta sauces and, and chunks of stuff like that. I'll cook them in the oven. 
let them cool, then I can cut them up. That's right. And then they stay a lot round, and then you put them in where the other stuff make like ragus and, and like big thick sauces. Sausages are an incredible utility meat. You can add them to anything. Yeah. They make everything a little bit better. It's almost as good as bacon, but we can't say it's better than bacon. You know why. But it's kind of. Here, you want a piece of prime rib here, or this is a strip one. This one was done on a, on a, on a grill, and that one was done on a pan. Mm -hmm. There's also a demi glass on there too. That's like a, it's like meat soup. What's this That's to keep the bugs away. Oh, that's smart, yeah. isn't it? So this guy it. here is called the shoe away, and he's got like little stuff on the hologram on there, and it screws up the eyeballs for the for the bugs. That's really cool. Yeah, we sell them inside next right uh, here at Big Mountain. That'd be cool for Daddy, wouldn't it? Let's take a look at this guy here. Wowzer, look at that. So this guy here, we're getting it. Oh. There we go. There's that bit of that stick. Oh, but that looks great. So let's put a little bit more liquid underneath that guy. Put yep. that guy back down that way. You got to keep an eye on those because you are going to be simmering away the moisture. You yep. want to make sure that you keep a pretty good cover in there. Otherwise, you're not really going to be simmering it anymore. It's just going to turn into a pan fry. Yep. Because it's a simmering steak that won't break down the fat, it's going to be really, really chewy. That's it. It will get tougher. It will get tougher. It will get tougher. All that fat connective tissue is just going to constrict. Yeah. You want to try one of those too? Well, I just mind there. the camera behind you there. <laughs> We're on Facebook Live, guys. Uh, yeah, so uh, other ones we, we should talk about too is when we do take these, okay. yeah, no problem. When we do take these from the pan and go with the, the, the meat on the grill, uh, the barbecue. Uh, for steaks, right over top of the, the heat is, is fine. Yep. Uh, pork chops like that too, yep. right? You want to get that, that hard fat seal on the outside so that it seals in that moisture. One thing I do like about pork chops is they'll plump. Oh yeah, they will. They will plump up like you would like, oh. Or as the steak, I tend to shrink up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the, and, and another thing about pork that a lot of people don't, uh, really don't don't know is that a lot of people are still cooking the death out of their pork. Yes. Because a lot of people are really concerned about trichinosis. Take it from me, or don't take it from me. <laughs> Google it. Look it up. Yeah. Like make yourself satisfied. Trichinosis is almost extinct in North America, and good riddance. Nobody yeah. cares. Nope. Um, so, so long as your pork is coming from a North American source, you can have a rare pork chop, and it's delicious. I totally agree with you. I've, I've had many pork, we've had this discussion with a lot of people, even chefs, that they were trained that, that pork had to be cooked all the way through, or you're going to get worms, or you're going to get other weird stuff. And yep. I was like, our pork is no longer that wild, gamey stuff that we have nowadays. Nope. The, they've basically gotten rid of that, that what was it called again? Uh, trichinosis. Trichinosis. The, the Canadian inspection process and by and large North American uh, inspection processes and standards means that no animal that carries trichinosis is going to make it to your plate. That's it. So yeah. you just don't have to worry about that sort of thing. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, there's a, a big pork chop, medium rare, that is, it's awesome. It's, it's delicious. It's so, you don't need the applesauce at that point. No. Uh, the other one we should talk about a little bit too is chicken. Chicken we did last year apparently. Nicole did chicken and she did it in the fry pans too. Same same process. Get it warm, get it dry, bring it up to room temperature. That's right. Right, and then and then it it, it shouldn't stick. You get a little bit of butter, a little bit of that in there. You should be fine. Uh, temp the big fat, the fattest part. Go right if you're cooking bone in. Go right to the bone. Mm -hmm. Like get right in close to that bone because that's where it's going to take a longer time. Cooking it as well. Uh, if you're cooking it on the bone it will take longer because you got to cook that bone through correct yep oh look at this guy coming up here this one here you can actually see some juices are just strolling down here in the middle of this thing that's where we're getting that rendering yeah that those fat bands that are in between the muscles are starting to render on yeah. their own you see that you're getting nice little seams so there was fat in there but now it's slowly been cooked out yep we're getting that nice little tenderness oh yeah she's going to start picking off here in a little bit uh for the barbecue and chicken i can tell you a little secret I'm not sure, maybe you know this one too. Indirect heat is the way to cook chicken on a barbecue. Uh, chicken has a high fat content, that skin, you want to have that. You know, there's there's fat between the, the meat and the skin. You want to have that. That's what that's what makes chicken so like, oh, yeah. juicy and tender. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll have my barbecue, and hopefully your barbecue is the one that has a single burner. Not so good. Uh, that makes it really hard for you to turn off one side. Uh, I like one that has two, maybe four burners. Because I'll turn the burners on high on one side, and then I'll place the meat on the other side. So you're getting what's called an indirect cooking method. Yep. That one you can close the lid. Yeah. So you're using the convection of that of that thing to cook the chicken. The the drippings go down underneath. I will use the pan underneath to collect all the drippings. That way I don't have flare ups. That's your biggest issue with with the chicken is right near the end. If you want to crisp that thing, 
all that rendered fat has been all be dripped out of the thing. It's not going to light on fire like in, like most things. Chicken that's got black pieces, not good at all. It's good. that's a really carcinogenic uh, prob property of that stuff. Yep. But the the dual sided cooking, the indirect cooking, is, is the best way to get your chicken to be 100%. It'll it'll crisp up if you need to at the very end. You can throw it on the hot side, then pull it off, sauce it up, away you go. That's very much another case of patience is key. That's true. That is true. Oh yeah, we're getting this going here. So another thing you can add to this here, uh, if you need a little bit more liquid in there, uh, what would you use? I would, I would, you know, I could go with beer. Beer works. Beer works because that'll then again braise it up. You can throw directly water into this guy right now too, because like I said, I uh, just reduce this. So it just keeps getting warmer. It's, that's reducing that down. We're gonna simmer that a little bit longer, but we're getting a nice crust on both sides of that thing. That flavor is just gonna be injected right into that thing. This one's a little harder though to keep medium rare. It is. Um, with with any sort of like a stewing cut or a, a moist cooking method, um, medium rare or uh, even really rare in any sense isn't isn't so much an option. Just because you have to make sure all of those fats are properly rendered down, properly cooked, and that's going to give you the tenderest steak. But yeah. because it's a wet cooking method, the more cooked it is, the more tender it's going to get. That's so it. it's a little bit counterintuitive if you're more of like a grilling steak guy. Totally agreed. That's, that's that whole stewing process. That's right. Is that, is that whole, like the pan sear, sealing it up, and then braising it or, you know, poaching it, yep. kind of another word of it. Makes, it, it just it takes a little bit longer, renders all that fat out, the connective tissues then break down, and then you get that nice pull apart, you know. Totally. I love, I love a short rib, for instance. That's oh, yeah. one of those, one of my favorites, you know. A uh, little bit of flour on the outside, the brown M suckers up, and then braise that thing for a couple, three hours. And, fork tender. Oh, um, Just yeah, stick like, a fork in and twist yeah. it, and the whole thing just comes apart. So, like that short rib, that's coming off of that ribeye steak, is it not? Uh, well, the, the short rib uh, is actually attached to the bottom of the uh, bottom blade, which is where this steak oh, comes from. So there you go. So this is very similar meat. Um, another bit of a sort of a butcher's secret is that one end of the blade um, it connects directly to the ribeye. Those first couple steaks off of it, basically ribeye. Right. Yep. Yeah. There you go. So go and ask for the uh, bottom blade. Bottom blade. There you go, guys. That's that's the butcher secret for the thing there. It'll probably save you a couple bucks too, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. There you go. Uh, again, that would be you would use this cooking method to do use that one, right? And that would oh, get yeah. you that same fork tenderness that you would off the off the uh, the primer. Oh yeah. Probably even more tender if you cook it right. There we go. That's awesome. It's just one of those things. The simmering cooking method takes a little more care, takes a little more attention, takes a little more time, but it's very very rewarding if you yeah. can get it right. Now, and that, the other one about this, uh, tone it down on the on the heat on this guy too a little bit because you don't want to boil that liquid away. That's mm. really what you're not. You're, you've got to tone it down to like a six or a seven on your on the dial. Uh, one of the things that I always say about the stove, don't cook on high. Cook highest for boiling water. That's the only thing it should be on high. If it was if, it was, if you're supposed to cook on high, it would be a push button instead of a dial, right? So I usually cook anywhere between a three and six. That's uh, mostly where simmers down towards the three, fries up near the, the six seven. And just to drive home the point oh, yeah. that this is so well cooked, no knife, this is just coming apart. Yeah, we're doing a really nice, this one here is the rendering of that sucker. So a lot of that dripping, uh, some of the pots for exactly for stews and stewing like that, they have dimples on the top. Mm -hmm. So that is to get that, that moisture to drip back into the pan to keep that moisture rolling in there. Ours here today, we've got a few little gaps on either side. It's releasing some of that liquid, but... And we're, we're making a point that you can improvise. The situation doesn't have to be perfect. Nope, absolutely not. Nope, this is trial and error, a little bit of patience, and then knowing what you got. So let's take a look at this guy here. Oh yeah, that's even, we're getting there. We are at, oh, see here. This one here, we're at 180. Yep, so, so this is already in well into well, well done. Well into well done. Again, the resting process on this one's gonna be come into play again, yep. right? We're still gonna have that little bit of, and then it's gonna release, and then that's where you're gonna get. We should be able to pull this one apart, I'm oh, pretty yeah. sure. Awesome. So what else can I tell you about meat? Yeah, what else we got? Uh, uh, a lot of people these days are very concerned, and, and for a lot of reasons they should be, they're concerned about things like uh, hormones and steroids in their ah, meat. Yes. Um, a lot of people don't know this, and once again, don't just take my word for it. Look it up on the internet. Satisfy yourself. Uh, the all chicken raised for commercial sale in British Columbia has been hormone and steroid free since the turn of the millennium. There you go. It everybody. is just the standard practice now. That's in Canada, not that so is, much in the states. That, that's in British Columbia. That's ah. a provincial legislation. But Canada wide, it's federally legislated. 
Pork must be raised without the use of antibiotics, steroids, or hormones. All pork is essentially organic. There we go. So, the, the term grass-fed. Uh, well, grass-fed, and there's a couple people in town who are probably going to get mad at me for saying this, but grass-fed is not actually a defined term under the CFIA. Ooh. You can apply grass-fed to anything. This paper towel, grass-fed. This stuff here, grass-fed. I can say these knives are grass-fed. CFIA can't give me trouble for it. Ah. There's no definition. Um, Grass-fed is an American uh, um, definition for uh, sort of a special quality meat, but what the USA or the USDA qualifies as grass-fed, here in Canada we call standard practice. Perfect. Right, <laughs> there we go. So if you're looking for that grass-fed thing, here in Canada, we've got it. We, we've got we've got good enough laws that have protected us. That's pretty as, much as it. The animal the animal treatment laws uh, in Canada don't allow for the conditions of a factory farm. It's just not something that you can see in Canada anymore. So that means we're pretty lucky that we even go into say a regular store or your store, you're going to get well, all of your product is going to be typically grass fed. fed. Oh, hey, hello. How are you? Super. Good. How are you guys? Yep. Oh, she's just inside. She's inside? Okay. Yeah, we're just doing our live Facebook Live. We're doing a little bit of chit chat about uh, grilling steaks for Father's Day. So some ribeye with uh, that's demi glace. A ribeye with a little demi glass, or that's a strip loin over there with demi glass. Yeah, just grab it. Grab Here, it. If, you're, if you're squeamish, we got two thick. Two thick. No, okay. I didn't figure. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, we're just chatting about uh, the difference between like you know, factory farming oh, down in the states. Oh, demi glaze, here. this we, stuff right here. Like raise our, our butcher here in town at Ray's Butcher Shop. So Brett Ray was just explaining that here in Canada, grass fed is pretty much everything. Pretty much everything. It's from our, from our pigs to our chicken to our, our beef, all yep. of it's grass fed. So we don't have to really worry about that, that stuff. So that would also mean that then our butter would be then grass fed butter, would it not? Sorry. Our our butter would also have to be grass fed by that by that term. Well, it all comes from the same animals. Right. It's all got to come, like the, the beef industry in Canada uh, serves into all these different things. Yeah, totally. What you could do is take that honey garlic glaze over there and throw some Right? Some oh, meat. we're getting in here. <laughs> Try some ribeye. It's be all good. It's got some demi glaze on oh, it. Yeah, Don't be go. shy. Grab a big piece. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Get that. No problem. Are you, are you I got recording? We are live. There we go. Thank you. What time's your thing today? Uh, we're on uh, Facebook. Oh, that would just have everybody yeah, Big Mountain tonight. Kitchen does this every week, and this week I'm the local the guru. Having lunch with some of the boys. Oh, yeah. Except for the half, I that looks incredible, right? Glenn. Look at the gold. Golden. So we got a couple more minutes on this guy. We're gonna we're gonna probably get a. This will be pretty awesome here. How are you doing today? Good. Yeah. I am super good. Thank you very much. <laughs> So uh, what else do we, we're talking about the grass fed, so that's one of those things that I know uh, very concerning for a lot of the people. Uh, I'm glad to hear that all in Canada that we, that we do have the grass fed product, which means we don't have to worry about antibiotics and... Well, antibiotics are still a thing. Oh, there we go. And disqualifying antibiotics from, uh, from meat is still a special qualifier. Okay. Um, you can find all the definitions for it on the CFIA website. I encourage everybody to look it up. Absolutely. Know what you're eating. Like that's just that's, the important part. Yeah, that's know, exactly. Know it. what the terms are. The, uh, the the labeling requirements in Canada are really stringent. If I at my butcher shop, if I put the wrong label on something and the CFA finds out, they will nail me to the wall. <laughs> like no. we have to take this a hundred percent serious. Yeah. Um, you cannot misrepresent your product in any way, shape, or form in Canada, no. and that's for our benefit. It's very pro-consumer. That's that's really that's that's what's really important. I'm glad we have something like that to actually take that. Yeah. away from us and onto some regulating body that's taking care of that. So, that's right. All right, let's take a look over here, boys and girls. Because this guy here, oh yeah. I think we are, give him a rest on this here plate here for a minute. Boom. Now you can see that, like the sauce has gotten right into it. The demi-glaze is starting to get a little bit uh, a creamy on it. Yeah. And that is probably going to be the tastiest steak we have here today. Even and though it's, it's going to cost, it's like half the price of a ribeye per kilogram. Yeah. You just have to know what to do with it in order to get the most out of it. So we still got, this is all the demi glass in here. So another thing you can do with here, now we can add, we can add some water. We can add some wine. We can add some beer. We can, we can bring this all back and scrape all of this lovely goodness off the bottom. But right now, <laughs> oh. You'd have to give that a little stick. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to touch it with my finger. There we go. Oh, yeah. Right? All of the fat from the steak has flavored that as well. It's yeah. just become extra rich. Yeah, it's thick. It's, it's indulgent. It's, yeah, it's it's like, it's. Oh, I, wanna, I, I don't want to say, but like steak sauce. Oh, yeah. But yeah. without the sugar, without the, the, the 
the nastiness that we have in our a lot of our commercial products now. This mm. is just extra meat. We use the same. It came off the bone or come from the same animal as this. We mix it all together. This is what steak was meant to be accompanied. Oh yeah, right. A good butter, good sauce. It's amazing. I really want to try this guy. We got to let him rest because we're not quite there yet. Patience is key. We Patience. can't get ahead of ourselves. It has no. to it has to be given its due respect. That's it. Uh, what other little tricks and twists do we can we offer here uh, in terms? Well, I know for me when I'm grilling, most of the time you need some sort of beverage. Uh, it does help. Yep. Uh, it, it's one of those things that's it's, it's as old as beer and barbecue, I think. Really, yep. when it comes right down to it. Um, some other things. Oh, how about? other t thicker cuts of meat like I like to do barbecue yeah so smoking meat is another thing altogether that you're taking some really tough cuts of meat oh yeah and you are making them into you, mouth water and you take things like brisket which is oh. like probably one of the naturally toughest parts of the animal yeah. and if you treat it right in a smoker or even treat it right in your crock pot that will become fork tender it will fall apart it will yeah. be wonderfully rich that's a time point oh yeah that's just very very time. time so on my smoker for instance I'm like you know 14 to 16 18 hours uh, and I just let it go mm -hmm. it takes a little time you brisk you're, you're spraying it with some nice you know I usually put some sort of liquor with uh, some some uh, vinegar and spray that constantly the spritz is like I like yep. to call it uh, a good a good hearty rub on the outside hey guys how are you good good and the trick with any of those fatty cuts is fat is water soluble. You yeah. just have to keep the moisture up and that keep will melt up. the fat away. That is it. And you, it, once you do get it there, that, that fat is probably some of the best, tastiest stuff you could ever get. It's rendered nicely. Again, resting it is important. Cutting uh, for brisket, cutting uh, against the grain. Yep. Uh, that makes it even pull apart even better. There should be a droop on it if you go to a drink or a little, little slice. We're going to hopefully get into a barbecue demo maybe this, this fall. We just gotta talk with the city and see if they'll let us bring out some stuff out here and play with the play with the toys. Uh, what else? Brisket. Oh, ribs is another one. Ribs Those are, are again low and slow. Uh, for me, on a smoker, I do a, a, a three, four, five, or a three, two, one method. So three hours on the on the smoke, two hours wrapped up in tin foil with some moisture to steam them ribs. Yep. And then I pull it out again for that last little hour, 45 minutes. That's where I'm starting to add that, that barbecue sauce. And you touched on something there I'd like to elaborate on. When you're smoking something, three hours is kind of the top limit. Yeah. After three hours, you're not really getting any more smoke into the meat. You're no. just gonna start packing on creosote onto the outside of the meat. Yeah. Creosote, like some people like the taste of it, but the stuff is basically made out of cancer. Yeah. You just shouldn't put that much of it onto your meat. No. That's three hours is kind of the upper limit. Yeah, that's why you, you, when you get into people that are doing the, like, the big barbecues down in the States, that's what you gotta, you're kind of concerned about that, that for sure. Uh, but like, we, I love wrapping because wrapping, a, it saves, it saves time on your smoke. You're not gonna get any more smoke penetrating because it's been sealed. It's, yep. it's, it's sealed up. It's just like that, that same caramelization on the outside of this. Once that smoke, you'll get the smoke ring that's on there. Maybe what? Oh, the, you know, a quarter inch, maybe. If on lucky. a really, on a really agreeable piece, you might get half an inch. Maybe half, yeah. And then that's that's as much as that smoke's gonna penetrate. If you're, you know, outside uh, smoking it, you could bring that sucker inside and throw it in your oven at you 200 could. degrees, and that's, you know, that saves it for me. It saves up my pellets and chips and stuff like it that. It does because I know I'm not going to get any more smoke on it, and uh, it's a lot easier to just turn the oven on <laughs> at 225 degrees and just carry it on. That's right. Uh, then you can baste it and all that stuff too, which is super great. All right, let's uh, take a couple seconds here and take a look at this guy. Now, see, we still got a nice little puddle on there. This guy here. Oh, I'm gonna move this over to this side. Ooh, juicy juice. Oh, see, look at that juice. So pretty much all three of them had the same color juice coming off of the three different pans. And they did. Uh, but like I said, the, you need the non-stick. We didn't do the non-stick, but the non-stick it won't it won't get this crustiness. That bottom stuff, the pan flavor. It'll it'll it, it just won't allow it. it. So let's do this guy. All right. See, and now with this one you're seeing it's quite a bit more well done don't yeah. be worried about that at all because with the moisture having cooked it all the fat in between it you can see these really thick sort of cracks Veiny in lines. the meat there yeah. that's where there's been marbling that has now melted away completely and that's all flavored the meat and it's also broken down all the connective tissue so this is going to be really tender despite it looking like it's a well done well done steak oh yeah so yeah look at this here's a good shot of this 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 I don't know, Jeff, can you see this from up there? So this little piece of connective tissue here in the middle, that used to be 
a big a thick big, band, thick of band of fat inside. A lot of people, I've, I've seen it done, will literally carve that piece out before cooking it. And then your, your steak's just gonna dry up and turn really, really hard, right? You're not gonna do yourself any favors. Absolutely. And I, again, we were talking earlier, fat is flavor, people. Fat is flavor and a little bit is good for you. Yeah, you're fine as long as you're getting good quality meat. And we've, we've come to touch on that already, that Canada here's got some really good strict laws about- Yeah, okay, that just pulled right, right apart. you see that? Just, these are like gonna be those tender little nuggets right there, let me tell you. I can't even wait. I'm gonna grab this. Get in there. Get in there. So yeah. This one here has already basically got the sauce all on it because mm -hmm. we just we cooked it in the sauce pretty much. Oh, look at those guys. See, look at this is what we're talking. So there we go. Yep. That right there, pretty darn perfect. Oh my. That's oh pretty tasty. My. So. Yeah, we've definitely got the flavor of the, the ghee in there. Yep. The demi is in there as well. I'm loving that. Yeah, it's nutting this flavor. It's and really, it's just, really great. It's so great because, like I said, this is one of those cheaper cuts of meat that you get for like half the price of a ribeye. And with a little bit of extra effort, this is at least as good as anything oh, else yeah. we've got on a plate here. We have now three different types if someone wants to swing by here. There oh. are no bad cuts, cuts of meat, there's only incorrect cooking methods. Hey, that's a good way of putting it, too. People kill their meat for some reason. I don't even know why they have a well done. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be well done. Save yourself some energy. If you're gonna go for a well done steak, buy a burger. Mm -hmm. Because you're gonna get the, what the burger still has that, those, some of those prime cuts, the end, the end cuts, that's how you make your burger or do you use whole cuts? Well, I mean, as a, as, a, as a butcher, part of the trade is we have to use everything. That's right. Every gram of meat that we bring in costs us money and we have to sell it for something uh, at very least in order to recoup, recoup some of the cost. That's right. So anytime you buy anytime you buy a burger, there's bits of everything in there. There's little tiny pizza, pieces of ribeye. Um, there can even be pieces of tenderloin in it. You'll never know because it's yeah. all been ground up and put in there. That's right. Um, but, um, a couple pieces of steak. Yeah, come in, try it. It's wonderful. We got a prime, we got a, a ribeye over here. We got a strip one here. And this one here was the- Bottom blade. Bottom blade. It's a simmering steak. Here we go. Try a little piece of that sucker right there. All right, all right, thank you. There we go. Oh, is that spicy? Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's bottom blade. Bottom that's blade. That's normally a pot roast or stew beef, but we've simmered it in a demi-glaze yeah. and given it a nice flavor. It's at least as tender as any of their steaks on there, and it's right. like half the price. There's no such thing as a bad cut of meat. There's only incorrect cooking methods. Yep. Speed is not always, mm -hmm. speed is not always the best thing for that. So, so how did you in the pan. So we, I, I seared it first, mm -hmm. got the heat up, right. seared it with some ghee, oops, okay. some ghee, and then I, you know, got the, the color on the outside. Then we threw the demi inside, which you know, I, I use the demi. Demi is like so. I took bones, and made a stock, and then I reduced it all the way down until it got to this consistency here. Oh, okay. Right. That meat soup is basically what I like right. to call it. So we put that in there, but you could braise it in almost anything, right. wine or beer right. or, or some, braised. it's yeah. that braise. So like you're braised. steaming that through, making that connective tissue come all apart. And that's where we get that little, all right. that end of like moisture. So you're gonna remember that when I come in, right? That's there right. you go, <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. all right. We'll be on there all day today. Well, I think we're almost there. But anything else can we think of about what other meat product? Hey, is, is, is Nicola listening to us right now? Hey, th is there any comments on our uh, thing today? No, not yet? Not the, no comments yet? Lots of viewers. Well, at least we're getting some viewership out there. Drop a drop a T-bone steak emoji. I think there's some sort of emoji. I was looking for him. I found a, pe a meat on a stick. Try this guy oh, here. let's have this go. So this is the, the bottom blade stick. We were just talking about how this one here is like, it's probably one of the cheaper cuts of meat. It's half the price of a ribeye. And, and, mm. and if you do it pan, pan side or pan braise like that there, it'll mm. turn into like that superness. You guys want to try? <laughs> Everybody's shy. Oh, they don't. Like free meat? What are you talking about? <laughs> that is delicious. So this is, that's our last piece of ribeye. So you better Gret, jump on that one. Yeah. Nice. Uh, this is a strip loin that's done uh, in a similar method. And then this here is a bottom blade simmering steak. It's half the price of literally either one of these things, but try it. It's at least as tender. It's just been cooked perfectly. Here, pull that one off. There you go. There you go. See that? Don't See be that? shy. Oh, perfect. Oh, it just came apart there. <laughs> Oh, okay. oh right yeah. Here. yeah, that's a that's a bottom blade simmering steak. So that is like, like give me some tongs there. 
Go ahead. We need some tongs. Oh. Tongs. Yep. Tongs. So that's been simmered in a demi glaze, and you can taste it like it's as tender as a ribeye is. You can also try some of the strip loin here to compare. Like that's a $17 a kilo piece of meat. This is like an almost $40 piece of meat. You won't even notice much of a difference. This was a little more difficult to cook, but that's the only difference. No problem. Thanks, guys. All right. So this guy here, we can go put that back in there. Oh, uh, no, no, you throw, you throw it in the pan. This is all going to be online on Facebook, so yeah. look it up on Big Mountain Kitchen. You'll be able to watch the whole whole cast again. You put it in there, you sear it, and then you add some fluid. Uh, Glenn made this demi-glaze, so that went on there. That's the sauce that went on there. All the moisture breaks down that fat and just sort of makes it all yeah. start to crumble apart like a really well-cooked stew. Oh, yeah. it's not bad, eh? <laughs> and then this is more like a New York strip steak. Just have a piece of that and compare. You compare the difference, yeah. Don't be shy, take a big piece. Yeah. We're having trouble giving it away. Yeah. You can't give away free meat. Right? What's what the, the world heck? coming to? That's weird. Free, free meat, as I've got the market today, and we're having a hard time giving it away. Free meat, ah. cooked by a chef. That's it. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, pretty much what we've got for the today here, boys and girls. Uh, again, I would really love to be able to invite you back, and uh, maybe this fall we'll, we'll get together. Maybe we'll do it not on site here. We may have to do it somewhere else where we show like actual barbecue grilling mm -hmm. and we'll, you know we'll, we'll bring a steak we'll bring some pork chops maybe a, a piece of chicken and we'll, we'll go I'm, from that i'm thrilled you had me over and i would be i would love to come back again yeah I, this was this was super fun i think everybody learned a lot if you had, did make sure you comment we're going to be facebook live uh big mountain kitchen or big mountain dot kitchen big mountain big ben kitchen on facebook you can find us uh, and we do this every week, so you guys come by on another next week. Well, I think next week. Oh, what next week? Nicole. Next week is fermenting. Oh yes, so fermenting. You come in, come, come in, come in here. Come in, come in and talk right, a little so next bit. week we are starting our next series. This was the wrapping up of the basic skills, breaking the fast, getting the families into the kitchen, getting everybody get comfortable and confident in their yeah. own kitchen. Next week we start talking about filling the pantry because we're starting to see some beautiful harvests come out. There's a lot of different techniques to store that for later seasons. We're going to be starting with fermenting. Yep. We've got Sarah Erickson joining us from the Garden Guru series and the local food initiative. She's going to be showing us how to ferment garlic skates. I'll be talking about my favorite salad ferment with a salad tur turnips, carrots and kohlrabi just for easy put together salads. I'm going to be making some today so we'll have tasters next week. Then we're going to be doing freezing, dehydrating and vacuum sealing. Right. Then, we talk, then we're taking a break because we're going to his parents' 50th wedding anniversary Ooh. in Vancouver. Then we're going to be doing batch cooking of sauces and canning techniques. Right. We're going to be talking about pickling. And there's one more I'm trying to remember. Anyways, if you have questions, I've already posted the event. So I'm going to share the link to that event go. and this one. But it's already set up. Everything's listed. If you have questions, ask them there. That'll go until the end of July. In August long weekend and beyond, we're going to be starting to talk about cooking skills and recipe skills of how to take a simple thing like this and put it together into a whole meal package. Mm. So it's going to be a fun summer, regardless. Yep. We always have awesome. a good time. We're always well, happy to have guests like Ray. Thank you so much for joining that us today. That was super great, Thank guys. you so much for having me. It is yep. so much fun to bring some of the other skills and talents and ideas from our town to bring them into this and just get more people cooking for themselves. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you coming in and debunking some of the some of the problems between the differences differences in meat like grass fed yeah. for instance that's that's something that we we're seeing a lot of that lately with the new health trends and stuff like that. Yeah. Grass fed this, grass fed that. I'm happy to hear that we don't have to worry about that up here in Canada that we already have that. So totally. Kudos to our Canadian the government for having that the standard set up for us. So Got to get something right eventually. It. That's it, right? <laughs> Little bit all right well thank you to everybody who watched if you're watching the replay please do comment replay in the feed yep otherwise make sure you follow us on facebook so that you get notifications when we're doing these Ray's, i've tagged him on the post as well so you can follow his butcher shop they have all sorts of great ideas and that background information to help you make the right decisions for your family totally we'll see you guys soon happy saturday <laughs>